Excellent. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, today, I just threw this one in as an extra. I'm so sick of talking about the gastrointestinal tract. Is everybody else sick of diarrhea? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm living with this, can't live without it. It's for your pardon? So you can't live with it, nor can you live without it. No, it's exactly. Very right. <laughs> yeah, but I did throw it in there because we did a kind of session on the imaging of the liver and biliary system. And I thought we haven't really talked about imaging of the gastrointestinal system. Um, and I've had a couple of cases uh, over the last week that I'll tell you about as we work through because they're examples. So I don't want to give away the punchline. But um, it was just a really good lesson in not pattern recognizing and assuming things are the more common things without kind of going through the process. It was like the step back and put all the differentials back on the list. I can tell you about one of the examples because I forgot to put it in. Um, there was a 14-year-old cat who had diarrhoea over a three-week period um, and was vaguely unwell but not terribly unwell. Um, and I, he'd lost a little bit of weight. And I ultrasounded him. They'd done bloods and there was a mild neutrophilia. I ultrasounded him and he had this gastrointestinal mass with lots of layering, mid-intestine, but the intestine was quite thickened either side. And I thought, oh, this is looking like lymphoma, um, but maybe carcinoma, maybe a stromal field tumour. And we did some efforts and it came back inflammatory. And I said, oh, it's probably a carcinoma or an infected other tumour. And I'm worried about going to surgery in this cat because the bowel either side didn't look healthy, like for quite a long distance. Like I didn't think that the entire abnormal area was resectable. And so I said, oh, go in at at your own risk sort of thing and the owners elected to go ahead and it was a grass seed whoa, <laughs> whoa. That so cool. that's cool it's so cool so this cat's just back to normal like immediately back to normal after surgery eating drinking well and the changes you know thick and muscularis layer like really kind of pathognomonic lymphoid changes or i shouldn't say that because ibd inflammation can cause that as well obviously um were uh, inflammation associated with this grass seed that was wedged in the wall of the bowel um so put everything back on your differential list <laughs> um because it could be any with gastrointestinal signs it just could be anything well, what um countryside was that uh, anna beg your pardon what area of the countryside was that that was in normanhurst Okay, so you don't see many grass seed problems. Not at all. Did and you... I don't, there was no sign that this had mi migrated externally. Like this cat swallowed it. Mm. And then it got stuck in the gastrointestinal tract. Oh, they can go anywhere. We used to see heaps of them in uh, the Riverina and in Canberra. Yeah. No, um, it was a weird case. We even had one that migrated into the spinal column of a dog. Yeah, I've heard of that happening, actually. That's kind of the path of least resistance for them to just head up there. It's hard enough to get a needle in there. I don't know how grass seeds find their way. Um, okay. So let's talk about a really boring one. Um, we have a eight-year-old rock wheeler who presents with uh, increasing frequency, large volume diarrhea that has been developing over the course of three months. And is progressive. He has lost two kilos and body condition and coat and things are starting to look a bit shabby. Um, wh what's your diagnostic approach going to be? I will think I'd, I'd PCR the feces. Mm -hmm. I'll float it. Yep. That's, uh, and, and bloods and urine, of course. Yeah. Uh, just to get a well, if I'm handling it as a specialist, yes, they do all that. Yep. Um, as a GP, you mightn't get away with it, but um, yeah. Uh, then um, yeah, then I'd go after stand. I'd say. Yep. Next. Excellent. Maybe even EPI, EPI as um, kind of rule out or investigation as well, so like a TLA. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Um, what was it in the history that flagged? epi for you oh, i was more just um the uh weight loss 
more than yeah. anything, but yeah. I guess the rest of the critical science don't fit too too well, but um, I think it'd be good to have it off the list if possible. Was, like yeah. Malabsorptive disease, maladigestion, that kind of thing. Was, was the dog anorexic or hyperorexic? Or hyperorexic. Uh, hyperorexic. Yeah. 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 That would fit with what Josh said too more. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm just making this up. This isn't a real case, just by the way. <laughs> so all of a sudden it's got API because Josh let me down that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, but it's a really good question that we definitely would have asked in the um, uh, consultation, obviously. Um, on your bloods, are you going to put, uh, what's, what bloods are you going to ask for? I will. Working as a specialist, I'd, I'd get a full blood count and, and full biochemistry and full urinalysis. Yeah. And uh, I'd probably add a TLI, like pancreatic studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll add a B12 as well. I'm well. oh, sorry. Yeah, that's um, good. Pooja, what did you say? I'll add, a, <clears throat> I'll add a basal cortisol as well. Yes, thank good you. One. Good. Yeah. And maybe because you're saying it's a three month history, I'll want to check even cobalamin. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Um, uh, there's one more test I want to do. One more test. Oh, Addison's. Um, oh, who just mentioned cortisol? I did she? Uh, I, yeah. yeah. We could do a stim test. Like that wouldn't, wouldn't be wrong. But um, yeah, Pooja mentioned, mentioned the basal cortisol. Mm -hmm. Do you do a T4 as well? Good, Josh. Yes, I do want to. So now it's got hypothyroidism. Same clinical yeah. science. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I can ask a question since we are mm. talking about this. So in this case or any case with diarrhea, if you yeah. have on the full bloods, like you, you, your neutrophils are normal, mm -hmm. say mid-range, and then you have lymphopenia and eosinopenia, Mm -hmm. Isn't that a like? Would you still call that a stress leukogram? Because leukopenia is a hallmark of st stress leukogram. So would you want to proceed to basal cortisol, or this is your stress? Uh, yeah. But then the neutrophilia is not there. Can that just be consumptive and it's not there? Yeah, you can absolutely have a um a neutro uh, sorry a normal neutrophil count with a lymphopenia and call it a stress leukogram. Okay. There's the only there's very few things that cause a lymphopenia um and one is loss in the gastrointestinal tract so mm -hmm. lymphantectasia mm -hmm. and the other is stress and yes. by far the more common is stress yes um so yes we definitely call that a stress sleeping you know, room that would be fair thank you um, no with the thyroid and it would t4 wouldn't be enough in a dog though you'd want to do a uh, um, tsh as well Good question. Um, and it's really nice to get a thyroid panel, but the clinical signs in this dog are not consistent with hypothyroidism. I'm actually considering hyperthyroidism in this dog. Yeah. What, what typically causes hyperthyroidism in dogs? Carcinoma. Oh, radiated, isn't it? Yeah, carcinoma, exactly. Yeah, so we're going to do a really good cervical palpation as well. I said, did um, you say hyper or hypo? Hyper. Oh, hyper. So yeah, we've got diarrhea, we've got weight loss, scabby coat, um, yeah. uh, over and progressive over a sort of three month period. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the other cause of hypothyroidism? Hyper? Yeah. Uh, other than endogenous? I don't know. Oh. That's a, that's a big clue. Is it because like eating the owner's medications, like Tharox, Is that what you're getting at? Um, that would be potentially, but um, they've documented thyroid tissue in raw food diets. Yes. Yeah, you told me that before. Yeah. Yes. So um, there's been dogs sort of testing high in thyroid hormone level when they're on raw food diets, and then it drops again when you take them off. Um, but they're rarely clinical for it they're not kind of showing signs of hypothyroidism good excellent so the reason i sort of pushed you on that is just having in your head the sort of the workup for a chronic diarrhea patient these are the tests that we should be doing i haven't put i didn't put cpli on there actually we didn't talk about that 
but I probably would do it just for thoroughness. Not that I'm going to lean entirely on that as a diagnostic tool, but it's nice to have in context for the ultrasound findings and things like that as well. But um, wouldn't you expect it to be high because it's gastrointestinal? You, you expect it to be high. So what new information are you getting from that? Um, that's a good question. <coughs> um, it's more, more big picture understanding of degree of inflammation and things. Gastroenteritis can definitely cause pancreatitis or elevated CPLI. Um, but not always. And you'd think if you've got CPLI elevation, the inflammation then localizes to that gastroduodenal kind of region. It's not, you're not going to get pancreatitis secondary to a jejunitis or a colitis. So it just helps a little bit with the big picture. It's on its own. It's not a very nice test. It's not a very specific test, um, but it's, I think it adds to the big picture. And the other thing so say we were looking for EPI, what would we expect our CPLI to be? Potentially low. Yeah, exactly. It's decreased functional pancreatic tissue and therefore decreased pancreatic enzymes coming out of it. So it just adds to that, oh, I really do need to ask these owners to do a $300 TLI test because I've got a little bit more kind of ammunition in that direction. Um, excellent. Okay, I'm going to show you, I hopefully, I'm going to share some bloods with you. We'll start a new case. We've got a seven-year-old cavi with very mild lethargy and going back through the history, it's got a bit of a funny tummy. It's been tried on a few different diets and things. Um, and it's presented for a dental because they think that's why it's gone off its food. Uh, so let's share... In slow motion, sorry. <laughs> ooh, ooh. I might not be sharing with you today. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, that's a shame. Sorry, everybody. I've got a new computer and all the security settings are way higher than I would normally have them. Okay, it's not gonna let me share. Um, never mind. So um, we've got a seven-year-old dog who's slightly off its food. Um, it's got on his blood tests a very mild azotemia. So the urea is elevated, the creatinine's high normal. Um it's a pre-GA profile, it's not an extensive profile. He's mildly anemic, he's sitting at around about 31. And he's got a low MCV. And his albumin is 19. Is there anything else you want to know about his blood tests? Is urine specific gravity? 1030. Oh. What was his um, glucose and cholesterol? Did I miss that? No, I didn't tell you. Uh, they were not, So everything else was within normal limits, but I'm interested in like what which ones you want to know about. Um, glucose and cholesterol were within the normal limits. Glucose was low end of normal, but there was a delay in processing the samples, so that's probably expected. MCV was low. Is PCV, was he anemic? He was. He was sitting at around about 30. Were there reticulocytes? They weren't. Was there um, platelets? There was 308 platelets. You made it up just then? Is that <laughs> Do you know what? I'm pretty sure that's right, but I'm going to check myself. Oh, okay. I'm going to open the button. <laughs> just when you, when you said it, I was like, <laughs> I'm not sure whether you can get <laughs> studies and how valuable they are. Um, Do you find it? Serum yeah. iron. Serum iron. Uh, we didn't do serum iron, but oh, 
I've never done serum iron, I have to say. No, I've not heard of it either, but I'm wondering about an iron deficiency anemia. Mm. Mm. What marker would you look at on your hemogram to um, help support a diagnosis <laughs> of um, iron deficiency anemia? Oh. Microcytic hypochromic. Okay. Good. Easy. Cell size and cell color. So MCV is your cell volume and it will be small with iron deficiency. Which it was. Then B pattern. Which it was. Which it was, yep, yeah, exactly. Um, and hypochromia, which it wasn't. Oh. But put it, I would put it on the list with a, with a microcytic anemia. I would think chronic blood loss and therefore iron deficiency for sure. Um, were other liver, liver enzymes normal as well, I'm assuming? Very normal. Yeah, right in the middle of normal. So the, because your albumin is only 19, um, mm. what is the total protein? Total protein is 52. So that is also low. So like want to know, I would want to do the urine analysis first to know whether he's losing protein through urine, because if not, then that's a, uh, he's losing protein through, like one of the differentials would be he's losing protein through his gastrointestinal tract. Mm -hmm. There's no protein in the urine. So then it's a protein losing uh, enteropathy, possibly. Good. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Again, um, the globulin ratio is close to one by the sound of it. 19 to 32. Oh, no. <clears throat> so yeah, globulin's a bit, bit higher. Globulin's mid-range. I'm really so, sorry. I wish you could see these. It would make it much easier for you. So what's the ratio? <clears throat> oh, the ratio. Uh, 0.6. Okay, so it's getting a bit low. Um. As an emergency, we would want to make sure there's no, uh, because your protein is only 52, there's, there's no hemorrhaging, active hemorrhaging mm -hmm. happening. So probably look at thoracic cavity quickly, abdominal cavity, if there's any free fluid. Good. Yeah, no free fluid. Um, so we've got a protein losing enteropathy and a mild anemia. So we've probably got some gastrointestinal blood loss. Do you think? Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Probably. Suspicion, I think. Um, is anybody interested in the neutrophil count in this stuff? Yes. Yes, it's four. Yes. Four. Yeah. Is anybody interested? Because of stress in leukogram. There is no stress leukogram. And when you look, the lymphocyte count is 1.77. So when you look at them, you know, like in the reference ranges, the neutrophils are lower than the lymphocytes. Mm -hmm. So we need to stim this dog and look at the adrenal glands and gastrointestinal tract on ultrasound. Good. Excellent. I see so, the stim would be indicated then. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, we did do a stim test in this dog. And it came back less than 14, less than 14. And it was a really good one because the electrolytes are technically normal, but actually the ratio is 25. So the sodium's low end of normal, the potassium is high end of normal, but the ratio is a really nice marker to calculate. What's the cutoff where you should be it's quite high? Where, at what ratio do you sort of start to think, oh, yeah, this is Addison's? Less, less than 20. Yeah. Less than 20. I say 27 normally. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So 20 at 26, so under 27, if it gets down to 26, there's a 96% sensitivity for Addison's. So 96% of the time, if you've got that ratio, it's going to be Addison's. Um, so when you get down to 25, I'm going, oh, yeah, that's just in test. Um, now, the reason I use this case is because it's a protein losing enteropathy. Um, which is reported with Addison's. Um, so it doesn't mean that this dog's got comor a comorbidity necessarily. Managing that cortisol level should manage the protein losing enteropathy, but we certainly want to keep an eye on that because this dog's going to have all the other problems that come along with 
gastrointestinal blood loss until we correct it. Um, but it was a little bit of a tricky one. Mm. Um, I really want to share these images with you. <laughs> Let me see if I can get into Zoom on this one and then share with you that way. I might have to end this one. But... Uh, uh. Um, okay, so same signalment, same history, uh, sort of three month history of um, kind of sensitive tummy, a little bit of um, capricious appetite and um, on bloods had a almost exactly the same mild azotemia. And um, very similar kind of hemogram changes, but the NAK ratio was normal this time. Um, and we did an ultrasound. So this is this is actually what happened last week. Um, uh, so we had this Addisonian dog, which is a slam dunk Addisonian, and then exactly the same seven-year-old cubby, exactly the same bloods. And I was looking at them going, ah, oh, do a stim test. And I almost said, let's just wait for a stim test before we ultrasound the dog. And I ultrasound the dog and it had a pancreatic carcinoma, which had spread all through its abdomen. It was just everywhere. It had a nodule in its ureter, which was causing ureteral obstruction. Um, so, oh. yeah, pattern recognition out the window. It's like your grass seed cow. <laughs> they cast a wide net and make sure that you're covering all your bases. Um, I'm just going to try one more time. <gasps> Yay. Oh, cool. Yay. <laughs> yeah, we're on. You can see it. Yeah, well, I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Uh, okay. Very uh, satisfying when you win a fight with a computer. Well, I feel like you've won the fight and I'm still like blind. <laughs> you can't see it all. Okay. Hey? You can't see it at all. Oh, hang on. Here we go. Can you see this moving? Yeah. Yes. Yes, good, excellent, great. Okay, next. So this is the adrenals in that dog. So uh, um, and on ultrasound, I just wanted to sort of, I guess, talk about what an Addisonian dog looks like. Are there any markers that you would expect on ultrasound? Um, we just have a small look. Yeah, not even always though, I think. Yeah, they don't always have low adrenals. They don't always, exactly, yeah. And there's not really a low end of normal for adrenal size most of the time. Mm. So often we just sort of do an ultrasound in these dogs, which is completely appropriate, as we talked about, because some dogs have pancreatic cast and they're in the ureters. Um, and we just sort of say, oh, gastrointestinal tract looks remarkably normal given how profound the protein losing enteropathy is. So um, these adrenals are kind of small size given that this dog should have quite a lot of stress with the protein losing enteropathy. So therefore do a stim test. Mm. Just a little, a little hint sometimes. But yeah, it was pretty mini. It took me a long time to find it. Uh, and then the <laughs> new computer. <laughs> mm. And then this is the other dog. Um, so I don't know how much you can appreciate here, but we've got quite a hypoechoic looking pancreas here. And then up at the body of the pancreas, there's this big bulge that's sort of 22 millimeters in diameter. And then as we go around the quarter into the left limb, the bulge gets bigger and it starts to just kind of invade the liver there. And then there was nodules all through the mesentery. And as I said, nodule in the ureter and then proximal ureter was all dilated and the pelvis was all dilated. Shocker. Okay, let's move on to the next case. All right, this is a cat who um, is presenting with a one-year history of diarrhoea, intermittent vomiting, and over the last month or so has just lost some weight and is otherwise... A, a well cat um still eating quite well normal appetite and blood tests on this cat were normal we didn't measure b12 
or pancreatic lipase, but the bloods were, and including T4, were normal. What do you think? So we did an ultrasound next. What do you think of these ultrasound images? A thickened muscularis layer. Mm. And quite diffusely, obviously, we have looked at the whole intestinal tract in this single image, but you can see there's several loops of intestine where the muscularis layer is thicker than the submucosal layer. What's the significance of that? Uh, inflammatory bowel disease or lymphoma as potential yeah. potentials. Good. So the rule is if the muscularis layer, does it, uh, let's talk about layering. Alex, tell us about gastrointestinal <laughs> wall layering. So you've got the um, like lumen is the bright light, white line in the middle. And you've got yeah. mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and serosa. So it goes black, Excellent. white, black, white. And I remember Good. because both the M's are black, mucosa, muscularis. Yes. And then taking that a step further, M and M's are black in the middle. Oh, okay. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> the only way I can remember. But then when I think about it logically, the submucosal layer and the serosal layer are fibrous, right? The connective tissue. So yes. they're going to be bright. Whereas the mucosa and muscularis are wet layers, like they're really cellular, lots of fluid. And um, so they're going to be black. So yeah. when it logically it makes sense once I kind of made that connection, but I used to just go M and M to black. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, excellent. So there's four layers in the intestinal tract. Typically the mucosa is the thickest layer, particularly proximally. And then as we head distally, the mucosa gets thinner. Um, here in this cat, we can see the muscularis layer is thickened. We've still got beautiful layering in there, but the muscularis layer is way thicker than the submucosa. If you see muscularis to mucosal ratio of greater than one to one, it's more likely to be lymphoma. Oh. So this muscularis layer should be the same width maximum as the submucosa. And you can see here, it's probably four times the width. Um, so if I see this sort of like quite profound muscularis layer thickening, I'm thinking it's more likely to be aggressive disease. Um, and particularly when that's paired with the kind of chronic signs, but then all of a sudden we've got weight loss. Um, to me, that sort of offer an indicator that cats have made a transition from IBD to lymphoma. But this is based on ultrasound clinical signs. Obviously, you can't make that diagnosis. And in fact, even histologically, that can be challenging. Um, so uh, it, I would treat this cat with um, straight to sort of prednisolone and clarambisol if they weren't going ahead with the biopsy because it looks like aggressive disease. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, <clears throat> you said more than one to one, more likely to be lymphoma. Uh, what's mm -hmm. the difference with, then with IBD? Um, so, you know, IBD is the sort of um, spectrum with lymphoma. So it sort of makes a transition to lymphoma over time. Oh. If, if With inflammatory bowel disease, we can see diffuse muscularis layer thickening sometimes so but most of the time once we're seeing it it's made the transition to lymphoma okay so it's not not all of them ibd can cause muscular layer thickening but not like this like they're not they're looking at the reference ranges with ibd they're much lower than the lymphoma cats would you sample the muscularis and like sort of get a diagnosis like like that um, the problem, the problem, with, problem with that is that we're talking about um, typically this is 0.5 of a millimetre in width. So this is a ridiculously thick one. This is pretty, um, this is the most abnormal I've seen, I think, where we've still got retention of normal layering. Um, so when you think about the way that you sample, you have to be able to move your needle back and forth to get cells. So the chances of you getting sort of more cells from that region than that you picked up from the, the abdominal wall and the fat on the way in are pretty slim. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, other option is putting some suction on the syringe, which when you're trying to diagnose lymphoma, um, they recommend not doing that because it damages the cells. So very unlikely to be diagnostic. 
And then the other thing is at the other end, the pathologists have a lot of trouble differentiating neoplastic lymphoma cells from inflammatory IBD cells. And this is sort of, you know, we can talk about testing for that. We've done that, covered that um, when we did the uh, small intestinal one, I think. There's sort of the PAR testing and then mm. um, uh, special stains and things. It's really hard to differentiate IBD from lymphoma. So the more cells you get and the more the pathologist can look at it in context, so biopsy samples, the better our chances are. Um, so I wouldn't risk versus benefit. I probably wouldn't. Mm. That was a long answer. So. <laughs> It's because it's not the wrong thing to do, and there's probably people that uh, that would do that for sure. And I've been, you know, certain clients, certain patients, certain vets mm. managing the cases. I've aspirated lymph nodes that are kind of five millimeters, and I'm like, this is really unlikely to give us an answer. But if you want me to, mm. I will. Um, but yeah, not into the gastrointestinal wall. It's just higher risk. Yeah. Um, we did have a cat who's a VIP cat who's a frequent flyer had had. IMHA several times and had a cysto sample and I must have must have nicked a gastrointestinal loop and dragged some bacteria out with the needle mm. and it got a bacterial steatitis in the subcutaneous duct um, which triggered an IMHA episode which mm -hmm. then triggered two weeks hospitalization and surgical debridement of the infected fat and it was just such a debacle oh. so i am a little bit nervous about deliberately aspirating this mm. when, when it's so easy to have things go wrong even when you're not aiming for that oh. um that's an extreme example yeah, that's really like I'm, unlucky. <laughs> it's really unlucky oh. and it was, it was always going to be that cat like i've never seen that before no, why would that, that happen in imha cat that's predisposed to imha that's secondary to infectious causes yes yeah. what are the chances <laughs> for that cat a bit high <laughs> yeah <laughs> because he's a frequent fly yeah yeah um okay so cat similar clinical signs intermittent vomiting chronic diarrhea um weight loss recently and reduced appetite and we did an ultrasound this time um alex can you tell us about this ultrasound with very limited images i've given you um so we've got gastrointestinal tract but we've got complete loss of layering um mm -hmm. and like with a hyperechoic focus and hypoechoic surrounding but it is poorly demarcated um yeah, but definitely heterogeneous and yeah, complete loss of layering at that aspect. Although it does look on the left photo, like to the more caudal aspect, there potentially some layering there. So I would have a look around and make sure that it's very focal and it's not the other layering is okay, but maybe a bit of loss. It's, I can't really tell from that. Can you guys see my cursor? Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Okay, awesome. So, yeah, I think this is heading into more normal bowel, like you said, and more normal bowel here. I think this is probably serosa muscularis mucosa mucosa. Here. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we lose it quickly in this focal mass lesion, which you described beautifully. Um, and we can see that the lumens are obstructed by this. Oh, yeah. Um, so this is a, a mass lesion that was on the colon side of the ileocecal junction, but pretty close mm -hmm. to the um elios you call it junction um and it's a cat what are our differentials i would say fib granuloma sorry say again fib granuloma Ooh, good one L large cell lymphoma um i probably also say i don't know if they go in that area but the feline gastrointestinal eosinophilic sclerosing fibroplasia Whoa, big thing, And then things like carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, mast cell tumors. You're going too fast for my note taking. <laughs> <laughs> that was really good. Like list of gastro causes of mass lesions in female gastrointestinal tract. Amazing. Somebody taught you so well. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, excellent. What are you going to do? How are we going to find out what it is? Uh, well, a uh, proctoscopy would be useful if it, if it's on the large bowel side. Uh, you mightn't get right up there though, so yeah. uh, I'd have to explore it. Yeah. Um, uh, would you do an ultrasound guided aspirate of this? Sorry, I'm, I'm my internet's not the best. I've had to use the phone and, and it distorts and I don't always understand. Oh, sure. Um, did you hear um, Did you hear Josh's exceptional list? I did. I was really that impressed. That was a highlight of the tutorial, wasn't it? <laughs> it was kicked um, off, was kicked off by, by Pooja with a very good one, though. <laughs> yeah, wasn't it? That wasn't on my list at all. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, I think I look uh, for zebras more than I look for horses. <laughs> they're way more exciting. Um, Jeff, the, uh, my question was, would you aspirate? Would you do an ultrasound guided aspirate of this region? Ah, uh, right. You've probably got the similar risk to what you described before. Mm. But what are our, looking at that differential list, what's our chances of getting a diagnosis and therefore our benefit? Some of those things don't shed their cells readily. Um, mm -hmm. I think if if you could if you could see it with a, a colonoscope, that would really be ideal because you could get a nice much bigger sample. Mm. Yeah. Um, and this one, so this one's just not intruding into the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract that well i'd be a bit worried that i might go straight past it doing a scope mm -hmm. if it was submucosal um but i think that's the safest option to get a sample for sure so i think that's a good good option um with the differentials that we're talking about here most of them shed their cells some of them don't so when i see focal gastrointestinal mass lesions as long as i can get to them safely then i will do an aspirate because focal lesions tend to be large cell which are easily differentiable from ibd mm -hmm. if it's lymphoma uh, they tend to be um, mast cells or carcinomas which also shed quite readily and so we've got a high chance of getting a diagnosis and therefore being able to say this surgery is a good idea in this cat or not. Um, and then the things that don't shed. So if I do a sample from a mass like this and I get no cells or just kind of a scattering of normal cells in conclusive result, I think it's probably going to be a stromal cell tumour because they're the ones that don't shed. So almost getting an inconclusive result helps me rule out lymphoma, the feline gastrointestinal eosinophilic sclerosing fibroplasia. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it, all of those, the sort of inflammatory and neoplastic lesions other than stromal cell tumours, um, like including leiomyosarcomas, um, will shed easily. Hmm. So if then I get an inconclusive result, I'm almost going to certainly going to go to surgery because those tumours are resectable typically and don't metastasize early in the course of disease. So I think surgery is indicated. Does that make sense? And then that way, like histopathology will help you diagnose exactly what it is. If yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so as well. Yeah. Um, Presumably this tumour is causing this cat's clinical signs. So if we can remove the cause of the clinical signs, it's almost palliative, at least in the short term, regardless of what the underlying disease is. The surgeons don't like cutting into the colon. Is that a concern or is it because it's diseased anyway? And um, They don't like it, but we make them do it. Okay. Yeah. We're going to get it out. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, they do subtotal colectomies for constipated cats. Yeah, they okay, but this would be as you get a specialist surgeon to do it rather than like a small intestinal mass in everyday clinic. 
Yeah, I think it depends on the clinician's comfort levels. Like I, I, I warn people <laughs> that this is going, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. yeah, I'm not cutting into a colon. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, we had a cat once that had a hairband in its ileocecal junction, but it had been there for so long that the whole thing was just a big fibrous mess. And like we've we ended up with two specialist surgeons in cutting together, but that's technically a foreign body that a GP would have had a crack at. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I just I think there's GPs who are amazing surgeons, and mm. yeah, there's specialists who are just at the beginning of their journey so i yeah 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 i felt comfortable great yeah cool but we you like i should think as a take it as a grain of salt before like the fact that it's in the colon and not in the small intestine i should think twice before i cut yes yes definitely (laughs) higher risk for sure yeah Yeah, it does make me go (laughs) yeah i don't want to cut it (laughs) and i'm a little bit more ultrasound happy than the post-op period like oh is it there we're good we're good (laughs) Yeah. Okay, cool. No fluid. So it's like a personal preference kind of situation. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I can't remember what's next. Good pass for everybody. Oh, this is boring. I just talked about pancreatitis. This is pancreatitis. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so six year old dog. Comes in having eaten a block of butter three days before, vomiting for 24 hours, dehydrated, cranial abdominal pain, elevated CPLI, elevated amylase lipase, blood looks like a strawberry milkshake. And um, we do an ultrasound. Alex, can you describe this for us? Sorry to pick on you today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not really, sorry. Um, so we've got a slightly or well, mild hypoechoic pancreas but it's quite um poorly defined Mm -hmm. um and irregularly marginated um the surrounding uh mesentery is slightly hyperechoic Mm -hmm. um i guess depending on who you talk to as to whether size is relevant how what's that measurement do we have it or is it more than it was 24 millimeters yeah okay depend i don't the radiologists can some of them talk about size others don't so i don't know Mm relevance but it, it does look hypoechoic compared to the surrounding hyperechoic mesentery and yeah poorly yeah. poorly defined typically pancreases will be less than a centimeter yeah. in width, but then we ultrasound them and we squish them down like this and like concertina them so that they sometimes look quite fat or folded and um so the measurement's not like something that you sort of always rely on in a normal looking pancreas but the contrast between this pancreas and its surrounds Mm. tells me that it's significant um, regardless of what the measurement is and then you might accidentally measure like right at the very tip and underestimate even in a raunchy pancreatitis um, Mm. and have it sort of measure normal but it's it's more about the contrast of the pancreas with surrounding fat Um, so beautiful description as always um this is a sort of slam dunk acute necrotizing pancreatitis case and the reason i put this in is it's so boring and you guys all know what to look for but there's actually a paper come out that looks at clinical signs with pancreatitis localized to the different regions of the pancreas because sometimes it's not the whole pancreas affected Mm -hmm. and it surprised me so if you've got a focal left limb pancreatitis do you think vomiting or diarrhea would be the predominant clinical sign Vomiting. I would have thought so too. Because it's next to the stomach, right? And the oh, but wait, but the right <gasps> limb is next to the duodenum. Mm-hmm. And the left limb's near the colon as well. It's like in between the colon and the stomach. Mm-hmm. So actually the other way around. Left the other diarrhea, way. right, vomiting. Yes. Good. Excellent. And that's okay for fun. <laughs> that has good. No, it was awesome problem solving because I had to read the paper and go, ah. Oh. And then thought about it that way. Instantly, I was um, like, oh, stomach. Left is next to the stomach. Yeah. Cool. I don't know why that's relevant necessarily, except that as a, somebody that does ultrasounds, I'll look harder if the predominant clinical sign is vomiting, like get up and under and look harder in the right limb versus the left. But yeah, I just thought it was interesting. Um, are there any other cases you wanted to, any other kind of, 
um, gastrointestinal diseases before we wrap up and do actually some interesting medicine next fortnight? <clears throat> I like this. Um, <laughs> I, I have a question for um, Pooja, actually. The, you, um, you, you, you uh, mentioned, well, the first um, differential you mentioned was FIP when you saw that lesion. I was wondering, have you seen one um, in that, like an FIP case recently because I saw one very similar and I'm just wondering if you saw that as well which is why immediately I was like oh yeah great differential no I have random things that stick to my mind and I think I have this memory that I've read somewhere that FIP granulomas like one of the uh, regions that you do see them is ileocecal junction now I don't know if I'm making this up but I think I have this vague memory somewhere so that's yeah why I had I'm one thinking. exactly there so that's why yeah. I was like oh that's awesome. Yeah. I think there's evidence like there's some literature somewhere that does say that. So that's why I had that on my head. Yeah. Because they normally do granul like granulomas, and this seemed like a world of things. So it's always on the list. <laughs> yeah. Especially in that location. Like that location somewhere else may not be so much, but that location, I, I have this memory in my head somewhere. Cool. Um, how did you diagnose that? Me. Um it yeah. was it was not a slam dunk, unfortunately. So um, we tried to get uh, FNAs as well as a, a little bit of free fluid, but um, and there were macrophages, but they didn't stain, unfortunately. So um, we kind of went off the albumin globulin ratio, which is really, I think it was like 0.2 or 3 or something. It was really big. Um, yeah. And I consulted Richard Malik, who was like, you should have been treating this yesterday. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, anyway, so it's not, it's unfortunately not a slam dunk and we didn't get histopathology or anything like that, but um, it's clinically responding as well to GS441524. Oh. <laughs> I remember this I have, now. Okay. I had to I learn how to say that at the time. <laughs> like, I think some medics believe that... Um, if you don't have hyperglobulinemia, FIP is not on the list. And I, I'm like, I don't know if I believe that just because medicine is never this absolute. So just because you don't have hyperglobulinemia, you can't, in my opinion, I don't think you can just exclude it. Maybe less likely, but you can't exclude it. Yeah. But I've heard like two different medics who will not even include it in the list just because there's no hyperglobulinemia. There was that study. I can't remember when it was. Anna might, might know, but um, it was when it was looking at um, this big series of cats and if it was under 0.6, I think 65% or something like that had FIP confirmed on histopathology, but um, there was still 30% of cats, right? That didn't. So I think it kind of shows that you could probably have a normal, a normal abdomen globulin is my yeah. understanding. Yeah. So I wouldn't rule it out. That's my- yeah. That's what I think, right? I don't know. So yeah. your thoughts, Hyper Well, hyperglobulinemia, takes a long time to develop like it's chronicity mm. um so if you've got quite an acutely unwell cat um who's sort of been hit hard early in the course of their infection then you may have a normal globulin for sure so mm. I'm with you, Pigeon, there's no absolutes in medicine mm. it's the only thing i know about medicine <laughs> that's not true <laughs> you know the way I look at the album and globulin ratios is if it like was say 0.6, I think, well, maybe if I pee, but it could be in an inflammatory condition. Mm. Up to 0.4, I'd say, oh, probably if I pee. Mm. Under 0.4, I'd say, well, if I pee until proven otherwise. Yeah. And yeah. I would agree with that. But then I think there's we're diagnosing them. We're, we're, I think we're pushing harder for diagnosis now that we've got a treatment. So we sort of see them earlier when they first present with their pyrexia and then go, Ooh, let's look into this before they've been that chronically inflamed and unwell. Mm. All right, we might wrap up. That's all right with everybody. Okay. Next week, next fortnight. No, wait. Yes, next fortnight. Sorry. Are you away, Anna? I'm away. Okay. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. So we're going to skip, okay. skip and the next one will be in a month. Mm -hmm. um and the subject is going to be calcium homeostasis so everybody get ready to get deep into that <laughs> oh, i love that it's so much fun yeah. <laughs> and then we're going to do hyper and hypoparathyroidism in the same session and then we're we're in endocrinology now so this is the fun stuff so, yes yeah, i love endocrinology. That's your so, yeah the house well <laughs> 
right? Because <laughs> you work with Jodie as well. <gasps> we should get her a cameo in the Cushing's one. Oh, you should. Yesterday, she was like, this dog's going to have a pituitary tumour in a dog that we we're doing a head CT in for other things. Mm. And it had a pituitary tumour. And I was like, oh, did you already test it for Cushing's? Like, you must know. She's like, no, no, I just had a feeling. Like, Jody it has become confirmed or anything. Jody has didn't. turned into an ACTH stim, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you just know. <knows. laughs> it was like infernasal issues. And she's like, I'll oh, have a pituitary, pituitary tumour. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> do you know i should um i should see if we can get corina graham to um cameo in the calcium one as well she wrote the paper on like her primary research paper was on parathyroidectomies and um they did ionized calcium before during and after surgery and paired it with a pth level and when the surgeons are manipulating the um gland the pth will go and then that's how you know you got it out because the PTH will drop straight afterwards. Oh my gosh. It's really cool. Anyway, so she wrote that for me. Cool. So she taught me calcium homeostasis. Um, anyway, we'll see if she's available. Yeah, we're going to do a, a guest star series. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. uh, all right. Thanks so much, guys, for coming. Nice to see Thanks, you all. Anna. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, Anna. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Well, those yeah. cases were particularly valuable. It was really. Yeah. Really good, I thought. Uh, really useful. Good. Thank uh, you. So worth worth persisting, even though we're sick of talking about diarrhea. Yeah. Um, you know, actually working out real cases and and um, and what to do next and, and so forth. They're really useful. Mm. Good. Thank you so much, Jeff. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a fun part from being very very useful, very interesting. Yes. No, I really enjoy it as well. It's great. Okay. Well, it's good night for me. Good night, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> See you soon. Yeah. Bye. -bye.